Hey, Pete. Switching my background briefly. Good morning. Greetings. Greetings. How are you, class? I'm doing okay. It has been insanely busy. That is great. Uh, we can't hear you, Pete. You're locally muted. Uh, how's how's uh, retirement treating you, Klaus? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, my wife is asking me that question frequently. <laughs> what in the world are you doing? Uh, like, honey, honey, weren't you retired? Wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we have just under 600 uh, registrations now for our webinar next week. And then I met with the panel yesterday. And I think we're going to have a, a really great discussion. Um, so, some some uh, really amazing folks on the panel. It's, it's amazing to see how that whole conversation about agriculture and regeneration and food and so on has really uh, captured uh, the imagination of more people. It's nice. You didn't send out an email, maybe that will... Uh... Did I forget to send this one? I thought I'd sent one a couple of days ago, but I think I... If that was imaginary or to a different meeting. Yeah, no, I, I don't think you did. Why don't I send one right now? And we can also notice note on the channel. So I haven't looked at the news yet this morning, but it's like you're in some adventure movie that uh, that changes the story, that advances the story like crazy. Pardon? I said it's like living in the inside of a movie when you turn on the news every morning. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, have you seen the, the video clips of people filling um, plastic bags with gas? No. In Gaza, you mean? No, this was the uh, Colonia Pipeline. Pipeline? Debacle oh. and gas hoarding. Although it's interesting that the same sentence would work for both. It's true. OK, I sent a note. And then uh, I think I'll also put it on the calls channel. Hey, John. You are muted. Good morning. Good morning. How's life? Not dull. <laughs> Lots of, you know, both directions, all directions. Stuff hitting. Um, April got her first, uh, her second vaccine yesterday and had a terrible night of it. I really whacked her. And I'm getting mine at noon today after these calls. So. Getting Moderna or? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on Pfizer gang. OK. <laughs> That's I mean, the, the word is fewer, you know, fewer reactions from Pfizer. Uh, April had Pfizer, it just mm. knocked her sideways. Yeah, well, my my wife had a terrible time on her second one with Pfizer, and I'm on Moderna, and it was okay. So there you go. She was, she was literally she couldn't base she basically couldn't move or eat or or anything. She had a hard time drinking even, and was throwing up wow. for thirty hours straight. Ooh. And then she wasn't better for a week. Oh, <laughs> that's lousy. Really that's really bad. Yeah. Well, that's the immune system waking up. That means it's going to be really tough when it sees. I mean, it's going to be really hard on anything I, that comes in. She was. She was like, okay, so I'm. I'm going to have great antibodies for that. And so then she was watching some really smart doctor on on YouTube, and he's like, it doesn't actually matter. You don't get better <laughs> immunity from more. You know, it's just, oh, okay. So it's just, she was like. <laughs> I had a friend who fainted the day of the set or the day after her second Moderna. So I don't know. Wow. Pfizer didn't bother me. 
quick quick question for Jerry and Pete. Do, do you guys have you heard of either Jill nephew or uh, Inquire? I N Q Y Y I R E. I have not. Does not sound familiar. Jill nephew? Yeah. All right. No. Yeah, I've come across her at a salon that used to happen around here. All right. Well, I'll I'll bring it in <laughs> for my. Hey, all. Nice to see you. you. Laurel, I welcome to the call. Thanks all so right. much. I'm happy to be here. Hey, nice to see you. Um, let us uh, let us start our our check-in process. And I think uh, before we do a normal check-in, um, Vincent has done a whole bunch of work on catalyst becoming trove. Should I just refer to it as trove period? Good. Um, on trove, which is basically a directory uh, that cuts, a, it's, not a, it's not a directory just of OGM, it's a directory for multiple organizations, which is cool because we can sort of mingle in the crowd and discover other projects and other people. Um, and uh, we're, thanks Pete, we are chatting in Mattermost on the calls channel, uh, which Pete has just put a link to. Uh, and I was hoping that uh, Vincent, you might explain and do some screen sharing to take us into what what's available, and then we'll go to our to our chickens. Sure, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I'm going to screen share right now. So right now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Cool. So right now the home for Trove is on catalyst.network, but in probably about two weeks, um, it'll be switching to trove.org. Um, and so Trove is gonna be the kind of new name moving forward for the platform. Um, and so, yeah, there's kind of two main, um, like user groups for Trove. So one is people who want to find projects, find opportunities, learn, get connected with other people and resources to create impact. And then the other one is um, people who are um, like Jerry, like Charles and Lauren, who have communities and actively spend a lot of time managing um, communities online. And um, it's a tool for um, community leaders and organizers to help manage that process and to build collective intelligence um, easier and in a way that's also more collaborative within communities and also across networks of connected communities. So right now I'm logged in. Um, so I'm going to go to the dashboard um, and I'm just going to kind of show the, the main features. I'm not going to go into everything. Um, but so once you create a profile, which at the end of the five minutes or so, I'll, um, I'll put a link for anyone to, to create an OGM Trove account. Um, but so once you sign in, you have a dashboard. Um, this dashboard kind of is going to be changing and evolving a lot. But for now, it has kind of like, what are the, the best things to do? So right now, adding an event to the shared calendar, which will not only add it to um, you know, the communities you're in, but you can also add it into what I'm calling networks, which are basically um, topics of common interest so that those events can be shared um, not only within the communities that you know about, but also in communities that you may not even have heard of, but are interested in similar topics like climate change or collective intelligence. Um, and so this is the kind of master event directory um, where you can filter and search events um, if you click add event, you can, um, you can add an event here. Um, you can add a Kiko lab or game B open global mind as the host for that community. And then you can also share it with other communities that you want to see the event. It'll show up in their calendars and with the kind of different networks. So like, for example, anyone in design you or, um, regenerative economy might be interested in the event. Um, you can also change the privacy permissions to be restricted to just the communities that you're in or, or private, but uh, this one is going to be public. Um, and then once you create that event, it shows up in the kind of public comments of all the events, um, which you can filter and search through by type, by the category, um, 
So we have all of our flotilla uh, Friday calls here, if anyone wants to, to find the link there. And then each one of these events has basically their own event page. And that event page um, has a uh, ability, you can add it to your calendar really easily. And you're also able to um, hide the link if you want it to only be available during the event. So to prevent Zoom bombing. <laughs> and if you created the event, then you can go back and edit it later. Um, then I guess going to the kind of community hubs, which is the, the real kind of meat of, of Trove. So this is where, you know, anyone who creates a project or an event and shares it with OGM, it'll show up in OGM's kind of community hub. And the different directories that each community has um, are, are modular. And so each community can kind of choose which widgets they want to have as part of their directory system. Um, so right now, the ones that I turned on for OGM um, is uh, link, link directory. So this is just a you know, really easy way to add um, a bunch of like a link tree of a bunch of useful links um, that are used often. The one that I think people here probably would be most excited about is a member directory. Um, and so this is like a filterable list of all the, uh, the members. You can also search by skills or you can, um, you can see where people are on the map. And once things start opening back up um, and people are traveling, this would be a great way to connect with other OGMers um, across the world. And then um, the project directory has a list of all the projects that are either within a community. So for example, the um, like Flotilla project um, or um, Trove are, are also projects that are like maybe not directly under OGM, but super related. And so it'll show both the re like related projects and also the ones that are directly hosted by that community. Um, and yeah, so Goalie bot um, project by Bentley. Um, I can only view the project, but a project like um, Catalyst or Systems Innovators that I'm an admin, I'm, I'm able to edit. And then you also have the event list. And so this is only showing the events that are specific here to this community. So I have the OGM check-in calls, the Flotilla Friday calls. So if anyone wants to know where the join link is, you can go to the event page um, or you can click the join link. Um, and I actually, this is how I got into the OGM call today. I found it on the calendar and I clicked the link. Um, then the last two directories are, are still totally in progress, but I just wanted to show them because I think they are useful now in their current form. So this one is a call repository, which um, most of the calls in here were curated by um, Stefan, and um, then we work together to, to basically convert it into a, an easy way for people to um, filter and sort through all of the past OGM calls and have a quick way to go to the recording. Um, there's a list of all the people who attended. And so if you wanted to find a meeting that you were in, you can filter where um, the attendee contains Vincent, um, and it'll show you all the events that, that you were a part of, and then you can click to, to go right to the YouTube video. Um, in the future, these events will be hopefully curated um, collaboratively by the community, and we're able to add some topics and tags to make it even easier to find um, the kind of past events and, and hopefully be able to kind of add to a broader repository of the, the kind of knowledge that's a part of each community. And, and that work has been very much inspired by Lauren and Charles' knowledge repository at Kiko Lab. So I have to give them credit. The, uh, the resources tab is also um, currently pretty new. Um, so it's still experimenting with the best way to filter and sort through um, resources. But this is basically a way to take like all of the links that get posted in um, the different calls um, and be able to um, be able to curate them in a way where it makes it really easy to, to find them when you're looking for them. So for example, when people are like, Hey, what, what are, you know, if somebody new comes into OGM, like we had a discussion about all the different mind mapping tools and, and knowledge argument tools. So what if we can, you know, put those into a directory 
where if someone new comes in and says, hey, where are the knowledge tools? We can say, oh, we're gonna point you to the resource directory and you know, filter by knowledge mapping tools and it'll show you all those tools and maybe even have a link to the event that we talked about it. And so the idea is really um, making it easier for communities to create this sort of linked um, data in a way that also can be shared not only within a community, but across multiple connected communities. So going to like the Kiko Lab repository, there are similar projects and members and also resources that will basically be shared across um, the, different, the different groups. Awesome, thank you. Um, thanks, Vincent. And um, Pete, do you wanna talk a little bit maybe about sort of connections to other infrastructure things we're doing or sort of where that's pointing or heading? Um, and then maybe also talk about the, the newly replaced um, OGM website? Uh, sure. Um, uh, Kevin and Jerry and I are having a bit of an interesting discussion over in the uh, Mattermost channel, by the way. Um, um, and I, I think that uh, Kevin's made the point kind of that uh, he's seen a number of these things uh, kind of come and go over the past 20 years and um, and we were starting to talk about how Trove might be different. Um, so I think uh, it's different. I, I think Trove will be different than the other ones. Um, Vincent isn't a billionaire yet. Um, uh, uh, Vincent actually really cares about the community and he's of the community. So I think the other directories, a lot of them are kind of bolt ons to, you know, kind of an ecosystem. Vincent is really internal to the uh, ecosystem and he's building something for, you know, his community and the communities around him and the communities around those. So I think that's one thing that's different. Um, another thing is that Vincent's got a lot of capacity to, to build stuff. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so he's going to keep um, evolving Trove and, and continuing and, and we'll see it grow. Another thing, um, Vincent and I sponsor a, a little sovereign called Flotilla um, uh, Tools for Connectors. Um, and there's a few other people, uh, Charles and, and a few other folks uh, come join us every, every week for Flotilla Friday and everyone is welcome. Um, so already in Flotilla for for months, um, all of this year, we've been talking about how something like Trove would have hook up to something like a bunch of massive wikis, um, uh, kind of both the social connections between those and then just the data connections too. How can we get, um, you know, Trove pulling stuff, uh, aggregating stuff out of massive wikis and how can um, massive pull stuff out of Trove and, and keep them aligned. Um, so uh, Vincent's got a, a big interest in not only centralizing the data, um, which is one thing that the other directories that have failed have, have thought about doing, but also decentralizing the data. Um, how can we do aggregation of lots of data sources? How can we do uh, syndication of data out to other, you know, other places where it lives? So um, uh, one of the one of the things uh, Kevin and Jerry and I talked about in the channel just now is. Um, in the olden days, you would put your, you know, you'd go, okay, I've got this cool, you know, profile of myself or a cool event. I'm going to post it into the the immediate uh, immediate .net, you know, um, and then it it ends up feeling like it's in somebody else's purview. Um, I think Vincent tries pretty hard to make it feel like you own your data and he's hosting it for you, rather than he's collected your data and it's no longer yours. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with Massive. We're trying to do that with Massive, where you know you you have the data right here, and it and there's ways it kind of spreads into the you know the rest of the networks, um, the rest of the federation. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of related, kind of separately. Um, by the way, uh, for a long time, there's a, a homepage for Open Global. Uh, mind, uh, openglobalmind.com has been there for a long time. Uh, Jerry set it up in the early, early, early days of uh, OGM, um, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and stuff like that. Um, Jerry also hasn't had uh, the bandwidth to kind of like 
uh, put himself into website design mode and go, okay, I'm going to make the website better and better and stuff. Uh, so it's been missing things like uh, links to the forum and links to the chat server and things like that. We wanted to fix that. Um, and uh, we had the opportunity um, based on massive wiki of um, evolving and maturing a little bit. Um, we have turned, we have taken a massive wiki um, and a tool um, that I built called Massive Wiki Builder that turns massive wikis into websites. So now if you go to openglobalmind.com, um, it looks like a website, it is a website, but underneath the hood, it's also a massive wiki. Um, so we're still getting to the point where we can, I, I see a a querulous look on Jerry's face, and I hope. Oh, that well, I was just going to do a little explaining of what you just said <laughs> briefly, in case somebody hadn't followed that. But I'll wait till you're free to pause. Um, so the upshot of it is, um, uh, along with uh, OGM, also has a wiki, um, which is running on Massive Wiki. And I know I'm using a bunch of circular terms here, and I apologize. And we'll make that all better participatorily. Uh, to, uh, we'll all figure that out together. Um, Anyway, there's a wiki for OGM where we keep meeting notes and and uh, encyclopedia kinds of uh, entries and stuff like that. Separately, there's a, a something called I, I call it main site, uh, which drives the, the website for for Open Global Mind. The good news is all of those things are pure production kinds of things. They're all things that we can log into, log in or authenticate in one way or another, and edit either on a web web page or on our computer. Um, uh, that's the good news. The bad news is Massive Wiki is still kind of trying to make itself easier and better to easy, easier to use, especially for folks that don't know a lot about, you know, the technology under the hood. Um, Wendy, uh, Wendy Elford and I have actually done a lot of work. Um, we're, we're doing great guns. Um, Wendy's awesome. Um, and we're doing a lot of work on making the whole conceptual framework and you know the ways that you like kind of dip into things and the ways that you would have friction um, we're, we're looking really hard at all those kind of friction things so um, there's there's effort underway to, to make all of that better um, uh, if you're intrigued um, uh, there's a YouTube video of me doing a hot seat in from in Kiko lab a week and a half ago um, I talk about getting into Obsidian. Obsidian is a personal knowledge management tool that it turns out also, um, if you use it with a bunch of other people, it turns into the massive wiki kind of stuff that we're talking about. You don't have to use Obsidian, but Obsidian is a good gateway onto it. And we're going to continue to make that easier. Wendy and, and Bill Anderson and I will continue to make that easier for people. Um, whenever you want to get involved, um, hit me up. Um, I'll put some Calendly links in um, in the chat channel. I'm always happy to to run people uh, uh, either like and and wherever I, I'm I'm starting with a couple different people. Um, Wendy's a Wendy's kind of a geek and she knows a lot about information management, and a lot about text tools. So I could I could start with her at, at kind of a pretty deep level. Um, Parmjit and I are starting at a pretty basic level. You know, what what would you do with Obsidian if you if you had uh, Obsidian? Um, Parmjit is working with um, uh, Winfinity to kind of figure out their framework and and maybe express it as a wiki. But anyway, uh, love to chat. Um, back to you, Jerry. Love that. Um, and I'll, I just want to explain a little bit about what Pete said with Pete's forbearance and with Pete's edits afterward for what I get wrong, and then go back to questions about all of the above, about everything Vincent presented and what Pete presented just as a conversation about infrastructure, about where we are. But it just occurred to me in trying to think about what I wanted to clarify a little bit, that it seems, uh, it seems Pete, I'm thinking about a massive as a meta-modern knowledge management tool. And I got there by thinking, it's not postmodern because postmodernism is kind of, to me, in my amateur point of view, about deconstructing sort of elements. And that's a piece of what's happening here is that, is that a normal wiki is an engine that shows you pages that you can click on and edit and build links between pages and it maintains the space. And the, 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 the trip that Pete is on, the experiment that Pete is on with, with Massive is he's separating the data from the tool um, so that the data lives on GitHub as a repository full of markdown files. And Markdown is this very simplified form of file. Uh, you know, Markup is hypertext is a hypertext Markup language. Markdown is a simpler version of how do you have headings and tags and page breaks and stuff like that. 
But by separating out the data, and now, so then what happens is most wiki software is really good at version control. You can go back and make changes and revert and do that kind of thing on like Wikipedia. That task is now sort of offloaded to the version, the very sophisticated version control of GitHub, which is also kind of like a geek paradise. If the, if, in order to make changes now, you have to understand uh, at this point still how, how GitHub works and use a tool that can talk to GitHub and put files back and take them out. Then also, um, most wikis have a presentation layer that functions like a wiki uh, when you're not busy editing a page that lets you click around and do stuff. Here, a massive wiki kind of uh, without sort of a front end, massive wiki looks like a collection of markdown pages on GitHub uh, so that when you look at it with a, a, an editor that understands markdown, you can start to navigate it sort of like a wiki, but that's unusual. So Pete has been building a uh, front end that makes it act like a wiki and then a front end that makes it act like a website. And so massive builder, and, and I, may have, I may have added one distinction too many there because there isn't that much difference now uh, in, in, in how we do this between a, a wiki and a website. But, uh, but the cool thing is, uh, and this is just the example I give because I love how this, how this goes, um, is basically a single markdown file could appear in the wiki as a wiki page. Uh, let's say it's Pete's profile. It could also appear in a PowerPoint presentation. And there's a whole bunch of uh, PowerPoint-like apps that use Markdown. So basically you point to a series of Markdown pages or you put internal breaks in one Markdown file, you hit play and it looks like PowerPoint. It takes over your screen, gives you left and right arrows. But that same data file could exist simultaneously in the wiki, in the PowerPoint and on the website and in a brain-like thing, if that page also had a little bit of metadata that said, this is what's above it, you know, this is what it's a, a uh, this is its larger category, these are some of its children, and this is what it's related to. And then it could show up in a mind map of some sort. Uh, so we're kind of deconstructing and then rebuilding what these knowledge management elements might be like. And for me, that feels like metamodernism, which I only know a little bit about, but I really like it. And it is a little bit Hansi Freinacht. I don't know. It's a, and I don't know enough. Hansi Freinacht is a pseudonym, uh, but uh, but there is a whole bunch of like like if you go watch a few videos about metamodernism, you'd be like, oh, this is a nice synthetic view of kind of where society is and where we might be heading. So I, it, it's it's a thesis I can't explain yet, but I, but I find really appealing. Anyway, Pete, if you want to correct what I said, then we can just go back to general discussion. Um, I that's that's close enough, I think. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, I, I suspect that sounded like a bunch of blah, 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 and like interesting Danger. little concepts and stuff like that. Um, uh, help us figure this out and how to explain it to more folks. Um, uh, we need the help. Um, and it is actually a really exciting thing. And kind of to maybe come back to, to Vincent, there's there's this cool thing happening in our federation, federation, our collective of collective of collectives, uh, which is um, a bunch of social stuff is going on. There's all kinds of cool stuff happening on Mattermost um, and, and communities forming and, and bubbling along um, and bumping into each other and mixing and matching. Uh, we're also doing that kind of with the tech infrastructure. So massive in, in some ways is at one end of like simplicity and, and, and stuff and then, tr and then Massive is actually kind of really simple and and flex, super super flexible, so flexible that it can be hard to use in some ways. Um, Trove is at kind of another end of the spectrum. Um, it's super powerful, super easy to use, um, very friendly, and things like that. Um, the cool thing is, even our technologies, as we're starting to work on these, which is different from 20 years ago, the technologies themselves and the technologists working on it are stitching together the ways to do decentralization and federation and things like that. So in kind of some, not fractal size or something like that, but even fractal capacities and fractal domains, you know, there's social domains where we're doing fractal stuff in organizations and there's technological um, domains and we're even doing the same kinds of things between society and technology. It's very cool. Um, and uh, Vincent put a link in the chat, in the Mattermost chat earlier about where you can register and fill out a profile for yourself on Trove, which I urge you all to do. That'd be awesome. And then anybody have questions about any part of this or suggestions? Yeah, I filled out my profile on Trove and I don't know how to tell it that I want to save what I've done. 
doesn't seem to be a save here or anything. I, it all, it mostly everything auto, it's auto binding. So when you type in the search box, it automatically saves. I actually saw your project looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, do you want to jump in and talk about Factor and how this works? You just posted a really nice uh, thing in the chat. And it, it seems like like what Pete described as, as our movements toward each other to federate data and, and features and capacities like is an important aspect of what we're up to. You're hunting for I your Zoom window. I was just trying to get back. I was, I was <clears> yeah. typing in the Mattermost. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I almost feel like I should just kind of read what I said there. <laughs> um, it's really good. It's, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I, have, I, have, I have sort of a bittersweet feeling right now because I, I'm seeing, you know, I've, I've been here a while, didn't really know about what you guys were doing in Clotilla. And the reason I'm here is because I've got a platform that, you know, while it was built, uh, you know, while it's a for-profit company, we're looking, as I've said before, at ways to make it a cooperative. And it's, it's just really frustrating to be not finding ways to cooperate with people. And um, I, you know, I, I, I think, uh, Trove looks awesome, and and I want to do everything I can to support it, up to and including, you know, uh, giving, you know, making all the the work that we've done on Factor available to it and open to it. And I, I'm I'm not out to become a billionaire here. I'm out to like do this, and I've got a bunch of people on the platform who want it, and you know. I'm just trying to figure out how do we how do we break the model? And I, I see Pete's got something to say, and I'm sure Vincent does too. Yeah, stack thanks, after Michael. Pete. Um, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, Factor is also another another wonderful tool. Um, I the so I'm going to build on on something um, in the wiki. Um, there's there's something called um, OGM community patterns or something like that, and there's a pattern for and this is not quite an answer to Michael's question yet, but I'm going to build on it. So there's a pattern for, um, say, emergent uh, event sense making, or um, another good pattern uh, that's kind of started around Klaus is um, food and regenerative agriculture and soil health and carbon. Um, those 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 uh, people start talking about stuff, um, and then it's like we should all start talking together. Let's let's make a Mattermost channel or whatever, you know, a Telegram channel, whatever. Um, and then let's keep talking and then let's um, maybe at some point it's like let's start doing stuff together let's start hosting calls together let's get you know more people involved um, and then at some point you say this is a thing you know this is um, this is massive wiki massive wiki kind of turned out that way um, maps and map making is not quite there yet um, there's a bunch of people milling around and it's a, a proto community it hasn't gelled and it hasn't said let's have um, let's have meetings every week and and figure out what we're going to do together, right? So maybe the next step for maps and map making is making that step. So then there's an the, there's another pattern which is similar to that, but instead of kind of like people f forming together, I think there's an uh, uh, the same pattern fractally, but organizations coming together. So flotilla, um, the flotilla thing is really kind of a, a meta organization. It's it's parts of Pete. Uh, like CSC and Massive coming together with Vincent um, and talking about how those two tools might work, right? So Flotilla happens to be, I think, Michael, the, the, the right venue for you to come together with Vincent and me. And I think you've been to the, at least a couple of Flotilla calls, right? But you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Michael. I, I, I think I saw one. I looked at it afterwards, but I don't think I've ever been to that. Flotilla is kind of explicitly, you know, there's, so there's uh, sovereigns uh, yeah. forming out of individuals kind of, but then Flotilla um, uh, is this new kind of sovereign kind of, which is a, a meta sovereign. It's, it's literally, you know, Vincent's got interests in, in Trove and Pete's got interest in, in CSC and Massive. 
and and we want those to play together and th there's actually a lot of tension between Vincent and I too uh, we're very good natured and we have a lot of fun talking but you know it's like Vincent is going along a very very like structured data path and massive is like you know structured data is is you know kind of the worst thing that can happen to us and so then we have to come together in flotilla and and then when we put on our flotilla hats it, it turns out to be different we're, we're kind of different people and it's like what would flotilla want from massive and what does flotilla want from trove right and what does flotilla want from factor so flotilla is that kind of meta sovereign that we would love to have you participating in and pushing on massive to be better to, to work better with factor and vice versa and pushing on trove to work better with factor and, and vice versa so that's i i hope that i hope that helps and welcome <laughs> sure. sure yeah no i appreciate that I mean, I also want to point out to you guys, and I think I've mentioned this before, that you know, meeting every two weeks is the um, collaborative technology alliance, and you know, people from Factor and True.net and Hilo. I don't know if you know Hilo. Hilo is very, very much in the in the realm, um, more overlap in a way with with Trove than it has with Factor. But I mean, there are all these people who are, are trying to figure this out. And I, I would just love to see us put our heads together more. And I don't know, maybe Flotilla folks can come into the CTA group too. Um, Kalia Young, who yeah. I've seen, he's the one other piece of overlap in those meetings. Um, he's working on stuff. And so there, there are a bunch of us and it's really tough to figure out. We had a big long meeting on profile standards and and schemas and you know we should just all be talking to each other and trying to figure out <laughs> how we can, how we can work so we'll talk about it yeah right. actually michael i'm curious to know when those those meetings are i think um i think that would be great i, I sent in the mattermost link uh, um the link to the flotilla call for tomorrow if you could make it yeah. Um, and, and also in the Mattermost, we have a channel where we um, have a bot that posts the, the join link. But um, yeah, I'm, for I'm, me, I'm, the... Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, I was just going to say, I'm totally there. I'll, I'll be there. I'll awesome. There. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think um, just speaking personally, uh, because there's like a specific vision I've had for like three, four years, I've been... Um, yeah, like platforms like um, Hilo, I like. I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how that have more of an overlap. I'm really interested in seeing how um, there can be that interoperability and like federation of data, and and you know maybe even like sign in with Hilo on Trove, right? Like that, all that kind of stuff. I think for me uh, now is starting now is kind of the right time because. Um, I didn't want to enter into those conversations with something that was so kind of uh, related that it would kind of not let me be creative on the process. And so like, I think now that there's something there that people can use, I'm, I'm much more open to uh, those conversations. So it's not like, um, yeah, I guess there's, I, for a while, actually hesitated to like learn about data structures, like going back like a year or two ago, because I wanted to see if there were innovations in data structures that needed to be created based off of a need and a use case. And, and if I just learned the traditional path, then I would have just kind of constrained myself. And so that's part of like, part of my creative process is like, knowing that I don't know and knowing that uh, I'm not going to to know everything and do everything right. But in that process, I might do things that are very different that are useful, not just for me, but for, for everyone collectively to have that new perspective. Um, yeah. So a couple of thoughts. One is, um, sorry for the tech talk, but a big piece of what OGM does is in fact infrastructural. And this tech conversation leads towards stuff we need to figure out about how, how organizations work together and collaborate in some new economic environment, which I think we're heading into and trying to be crash test dummies for. Uh, and so I think it's really important that we understand who is, what the moving parts are, who represents the moving parts, what their intentions are, and then how they, how they fit together. And I'm just, I'm sort of inspired here by the writer's workshop uh, format, uh, which is, uh, 
uh, Dick Gabriel wrote a really nice book about how to do how to run a writer's workshop. And basically, uh, the a circle of writers give each other their latest documents for critique. And the workshop format is done in a way that the writer is not the victim of the critique. It's just the work. And the work is in the middle and the writer sits out, each writer sits outside the circle when their piece is being, is being talked about. But the intention of the conversation is how to make this written piece more of what it seems to want to be. And here I'm thinking about Jordan Sukud, who's been leading us a bit into, into, into these sort of new forms. And he, he's always trying to tip our chins up. So we're always looking at our highest best purpose. What is the next best thing we can do? So here I'm thinking, what is the next best thing that Trove can do, that, that, that CSC can do, that OGM can do, that, that Factor can do, that, that we can help fulfill? Like, like what is their secret sauce? What is their special perspective? While still collaborating in the background across each other, while making these things sort of work across each other. And then the last thought here is, um, and people like Kevin who created a map of the social enterprise world called Ziggy back uh, a couple of decades ago, was it? Uh, uh, a yeah, map that, that almost, yeah. Yeah, just about a couple of decades. A map that didn't live that long, that, that was part of my curiosity because I was a, a busy little brain user going, hey, how does my brain talk to this Ziggy thing? And Ziggy disappeared on us, uh, you know, in the middle of all that. So we kind of need what, what Nassim Taleb nicely sort of says, we don't hear enough from the graveyard. We, we idolize the winners. We have somebody, somebody conquers the world with Facebook or with Microsoft or with whatever, and we, we turn them into idols when it, when it turns out that often they were lucky or anti-competitive. Um, uh, instead of going back and figuring out what broke from all the people who tried to do the same thing and failed, often with better solutions, because you very often it's not, thanks Pete, that is the, that is the link to, to Dick's uh, piece on, on writers' workshops, uh, which is super handy. Uh, but, but how do we learn from the graveyards so that we can avoid the mistakes, which is what Kevin started sort of provoking here on the chat. It's like, hey, I've filled out a whole bunch of profiles in my life. In fact, I'm gonna share a link in my brain to my online profiles. And if you go look at it, um, in fact, uh, I'll screen share for a second, uh, just because uh, I think, there we go, let me see my online profiles. Uh, there are many. You will see because uh, I used to be a tech industry trends analyst, and I used to say my job is to waste my time so you don't have to. And so I had profiles on Know It, Last FM, Leaders, LinkedIn. Here, LinkedIn's still alive. That, that's one of the few surviving ones. Clout, uh, Brave New Talent, About Me, uh, Branch Out. And as I say these things, uh, Kevin is probably flinching a little bit because uh, Pete and Kevin and a few others who go deep into the tech business have probably heard a lot, you know, peer index, short mail, Quora, still alive, et cetera. But I've created profiles on all these things, few of which were directories, but all of which required you to set up like, who am I, uh, what am I, what do I think I'm doing? So it'd be really nice to get away from this world of way too many profiles and not enough functionality and get into a place where this becomes actually our working medium for both what am I doing next? Who do I know? Who do I care about? And what have I learned? And how do I share it out? Uh, maybe maybe a long a longish rant. But uh, any other thoughts on this topic? And then we'll we'll shift into check in mode. Uh, Neil, please. Hi everybody. Uh, been a while since I've been around. Thanks for the tech talk, and I think that there is an overlap, and that's why I asked the question between your definition, Jerry, of sort of assuming the metamodern element. I wasn't sure if you're just talking about a more complex way of integrating, uh, you know, the, the technologies you're talking about, or whether it's actually the metamodern in the context of what Hansi Freinach talks about in the Listening Society. And so, the critical difference here is that he's talking about the existential threats to humanity, and the need for a new operating model for humanity above postmodernism. Um, the similarity is that you're talking about uh, a platform cooperative approach, which is above the level of the current systems, which don't allow the integration across multiple uh, mutually listening and mutually cognizant complex thinkers, which is what we're trying to bring together here. Where I'm concerned is that we don't end up with a platform that doesn't allow that level of thinking to come in because the metamodern revolution required needs to address the existential challenges, not just the platform competition challenges. 
And so there's the head, heart and hands coming together stuff here. There's the inner development required. There's the cognitive complexity required. There's the depth required. There's also then the code and all the other things that come through in the metamodern uh, texts about how we do this, which then tries to integrate and mutually respect the multiple different levels of complexity, cognitive capability that every other value meme uh, actually has and somehow integrate that into something that's of benefit to everybody. And I sense that's what's coming through in the platform development stuff here. But if it becomes just another competing, potentially failing island of sanity in a sea of destruction, then we're wasting all our time and energy. And forgive me, I've just come in very late, but that's my integration between the text and what I'm hearing here, but also my deep understanding of the existential challenges and how close we are to eco-social collapse. Thanks. And I think you've done a lovely, lovely job, Neil, of synthesizing and putting new frames and new words around like why we're here and what, what I think OGM hopes to be about. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, it'd be nice to not build another raft that sinks, but rather to build a, a rafting system that helps us live together. A bridge of boats. A bridge of boats. Uh, ages ago after a conference, I bought the domain raftify.com because I figured the earth is, you know, three quarters of the earth's surface is water. We're going to have to learn to live on the water. Uh, and there's a couple entities trying to do that. One of which is like a seasteading, which is a Peter Thiel libertarian nightmare utopian community. Uh, another one of which is called sea, uh, ocean, open ocean sailing, I think. The guy said, don't call me seasteading. That's Peter Thiel's thing. Uh, but he was trying to create open protocols for sharing hardware software and ways to live on the ocean. Like what works? How do you harvest energy from, from waves and sunlight in a way that you know, can, can distill water and can feed your plants and can stabilize your raft and can whatever? Like how do, how do, how do we build an open source construction kit for that? I, I haven't heard from him or about him in, in more than a decade. Go ahead, Neil. Just, just one little touch base, sorry, just to follow up on the, on the Bridge of Boats thing. One of the common problems of most value memes, that is the behavioral patterns and the value systems that people hold, is that they assume that others have to be in their boat. And the bridge of boats is about recognizing there are multiple boats, provided we can align the boats, we can build a raft and potentially a flotilla and or, you know, and so some are more comfortable moving further, faster with greater complexity and speed, and others are more comfortable being very conservative and staying where they are and preserving status quo. And it's how do we mutually respect that while bridging out to new worlds. And some boats have the same polarity and some boats have opposite polarities or bad metaphor maybe, but you know, some boats are busy rejecting and competing with other boats and et cetera. Anybody else wanna sort of jump in on this, this part of the conversation? Otherwise we'll go, uh, go into check-in mode. And, and thank you for that. That's, a, that. that's really generative and helpful. And, and I love hitting somebody who's read Hansi. Um, cause I need to, I need to do a little, the meta modern, uh, thing, maybe a useful thing we could do is sort of synthesize, distill some meta modernism for our own uses and for everybody's uses. Uh, I think that'd be great. Um, and Neil, have you recorded anything about it or published anything on it, on the theme? Uh, no, but we're, we're building it into, uh, the work that Anne and myself are doing. We both read that. Uh, we also have some younger players in Australia, um, two of the most conscious young men that I know that pointed me to the work um, and they're in their 20s. And so there's, a, there's a, a yearning for something better than the existing models. And there's also a recognition of the need for the consciousness not to be putting the other models down because everybody's at their own particular point on the journey. And so how do you hold the humility of the, the privileged capability, maturity, capacity that we actually have to hold that complexity and also bring a new narrative to change the way in which everybody operates or we're all stuffed. And so it's the different you know, challenge in between the, the arrogance versus the humility and how do you hold your own complexity with humility and the humility of, and the complexity of all others. Thank you. And my present shorthand for this dilemma, and the, I'm not gonna map it directly to what you said, but, but my, own, my own big question in the back of my head is what are the, what are, what is the next social stack and what is the next organizational stack? And I'm borrowing here from software stacks like the LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Uh, but I'm saying, 
hey, the social contract is broken. We're trying to figure out, is it, is it capitalism with Chinese characteristics? Is that what's going to win? Is it Northern European social democracies? Like that, that question is sort of up for grabs and the social protests around the world are telling us that that's broken. And then everybody's fishing around going, should I, should I become a multi-stakeholder cooperative? Should I become an L3C? Like, don't really want to be a C-corp. How does that work? And what is the new corporate? And how do we move value, not just within a corporation, a major multinational, but across an ecosystem of loosely collaborating entities like a flotilla, perhaps? Uh, you know, what, what does that look like? So, so my two stacks question is, is maps to a bit to what you're talking about. And I wanna go way deeper into that. But then, but then my, my realistic mind says that one of the things I learned from, from uh, Pol Carl Polanyi was that capitalism is like a cuckoo bird. It's a, it's a brood predator. It can't have other forms of living coexisting with capitalism. It needs everybody to be in the labor pool. It needs all the land to be available for purchase. So it has means of basically enclosing and eating everything. And how do you create the collaborative, interdependent weaving of, of systems that you described, Neil, when some of the players are like that? When some of the players are, are, are basically not out for any kind of collaboration like that, they will, they will sort of eat anything that they touch. Cool, uh, Vincent. Yeah, I think um, one thing that was part like to your point, Jerry, of like, how do we <laughs> exist when, when there where there are players that are just trying to profit? And I think the B Corp model, um, I've heard some interesting critiques about the B Corp model as, uh, well, I've heard there's amazing things about the B Corp model. And the critiques of the B Corp model is that it doesn't go far enough because being a B Corp is about doing more good. It's not about doing less bad. And so how do we both take away the kind of um, you know, power from the bad players and then also be able to create more good. And I think the trend that I've been seeing, which seems to align most with that type of philosophy is, um, is the kind of idea of just, decentraliz just decentralization as a trend. And so if you could buy up ExxonMobil and then decentralize it so it's cooperatively owned, the like my just kind of gut intuition is the more people that own something, the more likely that it's going to be steer, steered in the right direction because it has a there's much more alignment between the incentives of the individuals that have the ownership over it and the the actual constituents, uh, the stakeholders, and especially as you know we live in a globalized world where. Um, you can have a company that literally touches every <laughs> country in the planet, like, like a platform like Facebook. Like what if a platform like Facebook was decentrally owned? Would it still have the same advertising model would it, or, or would it be steered in, in a different direction? So I think just decentralization and figuring out some creative ways to, you know, I mean, there's, there's like, you know, fighting against the, the, the evil, but then there's also making new models that make the kind of players that we don't want obsolete. And I think the kind of cooperative model is, is just the, the trend that I've been diving into. And uh, I posted in the Mattermost, I'm gonna be taking a course. So if anyone wants to take it along with me and then maybe do kind of like a book club where maybe we, we meet after, before, during or after to talk about it, it's um, Start Co-op on Teachable. It's a Lean Co-op course. Um, it was recommended in the Dent Forum on Clubhouse, which is a really incredible, um, uh, one of the best clubs on Clubhouse. Um, and they talk a lot about economic systems and just like broader economic issues. And, and um, there was two people from Start Co-op there that um, Start Co-op is an organization that helps cooperatives. Um, I believe they have an accelerator program as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And Vincent put a link to that earlier in the chat, which is awesome. Um, that sounds like a great idea. Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I'm coming from the application perspective and there are all these wonderful tools coming in, but uh, I mean, I have like zero bandwidth to even focus on, on developing tools, right? But I can see the benefit of applying these kinds of tools. So the challenge really is, you know, to bring a practitioner together with the toolmaker and and uh, 
and find forms of applications. And it's just to show that there is no single guy doing anything much, right? You need a team of different skill sets in order to accomplish much of anything. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So Michael, I think you're like in the throes of this kind of decision-making about factor and like choosing models and all that. I, th I thought I'd pass it back to you then just ask you to check in and maybe we'll go Michael, Kevin, Julian. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my check-in hopefully without much tech talk. Um, uh, but, you know, in the greater, in the greater sense, the, the idea of cooperative models and business models, I think, is, is key in a lot of fields and, and particularly this one uh, and, and decentralization. Um, uh, Vincent, in the Mattermost chat, um, mentioned he'd been hearing about Nathan Schneider, who is a great, you know, He's, he's working out of the uh, University of Colorado and is sort of one of the chief spokespeople for the cooperative movement. And, and you know, I've talked also, to him. He's also a friend. Huh? Yeah, he's also he's a friend. friend. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there really seems like there is a moment now between uh, Zebras Unite and, and you know, start our co-op and there are other events that I can share other things with you and I'm happy to share with both other folks too. Um, the, the cooperative movement and the exit to community movement are, are really gaining steam. Um, and the, the conversations, it's like the, the business model question and the um, standards questions in any kind of network of decentralized things are the thorny issues. Um, I'd be curious, you know, one, one of the entities, and I think I mentioned this last week, I'm sorry, I'm having so many conversations around this that I forget what I've said where, but um, uh, there's a, there's a, an entity called the digitalstandard.org that is um, involves um, consumer reports. And I have to say that consumer reports as an institution, I think is a really nice, you know, established, not, not too new agey. I mean, one of the things about, I think all the, all the co-op movements going on is a lot of them do get a little bit woo woo, and um, in it, the the consumer reports involvement in this world, I think, could be really beneficial to all of us, and and letting them have some input into into what we're doing because they can mainstream stuff that and and give credibility to stuff that would be hard for all of us as outsiders to, to generate. Um, and then personal check-in, just uh, putting one foot in, foot in front of the other, fully vaccinated, tending some chickens. Like awesome, today. that's great. I'll be fully vaccinated at 1 p.m. today. Um, Neil, do you wanna do a quick check-in uh, before you have to take off? And thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for that, guys. Um, and sorry, I, I came in late, haven't been around for a while and already said, already said a fair bit, um, but I have to go for dinner shortly. I'm in Belgium, uh, for those that don't know. Um, good to see you all. Good to see that the work is continuing and very pleased to see that a couple of platforms are coming together here. And I'm so I'm keen to stay involved. Haven't been involved uh, as closely because there's been an overlap between a meeting I was having with uh, Fallon, uh, who has regularly been an attendee here. Um, but because our, our meetings have overlapped now for the last couple of months, um, yeah, so I've asked him to shift that meeting so that I can drop in here more regularly. But obviously with the work that Fallon's doing, there's an interface there between the sort of software, uh, hardware, uh, platforms, design, but also the ethical thinking uh, element and where he's interested in the work that we're doing, Anne and I are doing here in Belgium, um, around our now what you know, now that we know these things about the existential challenges, the compounding systemic failures and so on, um, what are we gonna do about it? And so the question is, and now what, right? And so the, the inner development required to, uh, to enable you to deeply contemplate, hold and accept what's happening 
and the reality, the external reality of what's actually happening and bridging that gap between the educational component and the inner development component required to hold that and then bringing that into the world. And so there's elements there that link back very much to the metamodern uh, stuff we're talking about, to Keegan and you know, multiple levels of consciousness, to recognizing where, where individuals are at in their journey, to the strange attractor element of putting a warning on the door and saying, don't come in if you're afraid of this stuff because we're going to be talking about it. And so you know, now that you're here, don't say you didn't want to come and now how we're going to have these courageous conversations. And ultimately, all this will hopefully lead to a community of people that are better prepared internally for the battles they're facing externally, fighting multiple worldviews and multiple perspectives, but also hopefully some sort of mutually assistive community, which is where it parallels with the sort of stuff that OGM, uh, that I can see OGM potentially doing. You know, how do we help coordinate a critical mass of increasingly conscious people with the cognitive capability to at least be holding the, the complexity of what's happening until new patterns can form? And how do we do that with the compassion and the res mutual respect required for people who aren't yet capable in the same way we would with children that can't walk yet? You know, we don't assume they never will. Uh, we just assume they haven't learned yet. And so holding that space, but of course also then the deep existential challenges that come with that about how do we prepare ourselves individually and with myself and my partner here in Belgium and our friend David, facilitator in, in Australia, how do we show up fully for others on this journey if we haven't been on this journey? And so we have a three hour conversation on Zoom with our friend in Australia every week. And these go into very deep stuff around violence, levels of violence we might need to actually counteract systemic harms that are already so violent we are ignorant to them. Um, new economies, new models forming and so on. And so how do we do that unless we have uh, a group of people who have the capacity to hold that and to hold the complexity of the chaos below them um, in that process without being elitist because of the humility of recognizing this still works in progress themselves. So that's a very brief big picture nutshell of uh, the complexity of what we're dealing with. Uh, on the personal front, loving spring here, it's a wetter spring here than last year. So I'm actually seeing things at a different sequence, the memories on Facebook come up and I say, oh, well, the things haven't flowered yet or they're already, we're already this far ahead, but much uh, moister. So hopefully get a better crop this year. And secondly, despite all this inner development work, still feeling very guilty about the lack of outer representation, the inability yet to put a website in front of you guys, that sort of stuff. And so there's these dual imperatives of, how do we do the work to better articulate it? And, and every opportunity like this helps. And secondly, how do we then present that in a way that doesn't scare everybody away because we still need income, but at the same time doesn't bring everybody in because it's so bland that everybody thinks, oh, this is for me, when it's actually a pretty privileged, almost elitist element of people that are privileged enough to have the time to do this sort of thinking on behalf of, not because of, the, the, you know, their own personal profit on behalf of the collective. And so I still honor the, the wonderful work you guys are doing and how you're taking those systematic steps forward towards the systemic challenges that we've got. So thanks very much for all being here. And um, yeah, thanks very much for giving me a chance to check in uh, early in the piece, Jerry. I'll hang around as long as I can, but I'll probably get a clip around the ear very shortly for being late. So nice to see you all, take care. Thank you so much, Neil, I really appreciate that. And for a future conversation, I would love to know what technological modes of expression best suit you and your disposition and intentions. Like what kinds of tools have you liked? What, you know, how, how does that work? But I think that, you know, I think that's a fun, juicy thing to talk about down the road a little bit. Wonderful, a quick snap, quick snapshot. We're in the process of upgrading um, at our hardware. We're, we may have to come and talk to you about how do we get the best uh, quality software and support, but I know I've got a good support community here that can point me to all the new things coming and some things they haven't even put on the books yet. So thanks very much guys for, for being there and uh, look forward to, to interacting with you as we go to that next stage. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go Kevin, Julian, Lorelai. Uh, you're muted, Kevin. 
it's Neil, kind, of a, sure. it's kind of a newbie era, but there you are. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, Neil, I, I'm sure I misunderstood you where you're trying to help the lower orders evolve up to your level, but that's sure what it sounded like. And I've, I've never really liked being in that kind of group. <clears throat> I stumbled into some cults back in the 60s and you know, below Santa Barbara that that seemed to have that goal. And I'm sure that's, that's what you said, but it's probably not the way you meant it of helping the lower orders evolve up to your level. So I've, I, I have a, a, you know, it, it makes my skin crawl up backwards and, and, and you know, look, look for my knives, but uh, that's, just, that's just me. I'm doing a, we, it, the, our community equity fund, we're looking to expand it to another community where they also have real estate and we've got an opportunity zone fund. That I, for newbies, we've been working on a fund and we raised our first million to uh, do friends and family funding for uh, entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle. And we're looking to expand it. We, we've come up with, it was really complicated. We finally, we came up with a simple model and, and it got easy. And uh, we're looking at some of those things too. We're doing a thing in June back in Mississippi with some, you know, um, influential Mississippians, uh, a state, a U.S. Senator and a, a, a district, federal district judge. And <clears throat> we're going to elect a monument to uh, Billy Joe McAllister right there at the Tallahatchie Bridge uh, in Clarksdale, if you know the song I'm talking about, of Ode to Billy Joe. And I'm writing a paper on um, what happened in uh, colonial times when the Baptist preachers wanted to preach to the slaves owned by the Episcopalians and they had, they had two condi conditions. One is that you had to have Exodus being spiritual, so you couldn't be let my people go. And the second was that you couldn't talk about Jubilee and, and uh, forgiveness of debts. You had to enshrine property and capital. And that made the Baptists limit what they did. And so the, uh, 150 years later, when I was in Jackson, we were building the largest habitat chapter in the country. The First Baptist Church didn't know why they were building a house, except that they were three years behind the Junior League. And so they had to, but they said our business is saving souls. But the other part of it will be looking at how the landed um, got uh, bound by their own oppression. <clears throat> and that's kind of where some of the bargain where they had to get poor whites to side with them against blacks uh, and, and lining them up pro wealth, uh, even though they were poor. And uh, so anyway, I'm gonna write, be writing a paper with some history around that. And, but one of the neat things about these devil's bargains is they're actually written down. You know, There was an actual agreement, you, know, you can't do that. And in the uh, Freedom Summer in 1963, um, um, what's his name, um, who led the Freedom Summary, which was the, the voting registration at, at Goodman, Cheney, Schwerner, et cetera. One of the things he had to do was physicalize uh, Exodus and they had to re retrain black churches that this means let our people go. So old black folks could go to the polls and could go register. And so they had to you know, reclaim the, 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 the captive gospel that they'd had essentially. <clears throat> um, and uh, I've, you know, I've talked to him about that. And uh, so anyway, it's, I think it's going to be kind of interesting uh, that we're going to do there. And, you know, there will be a monument to Billy Joe, whatever Billy Joe McAllister threw off the Tallahatchie Bridge. So that's what I'm up to. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, the, the documentary, The Black Church, is excellent on a lot of this history. And a bunch of other the stuff I, I didn't know. The documentary is called The Black Church. Hmm. Uh, it's a PBS book? documentary, two, oh. two, two hours. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the PBS documentary, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's excellent. I was, I, I was surprised at how, how much I learned. I was like, wow, I mm. thought I was informed, not that informed. Um, Klaus? Yeah, to, to Kevin's earlier comments, I don't know you're starting out uh, uh, with, with Neil framing his his points in ways that that uh, just walk you the wrong way, that's actually a pretty common thing, you know, for mm. um, for for me as well, right? Because um, when you when you um, operate in your daily frame of mind, uh, it's really a skill to step back and be thoughtful about how you communicate. Um, not not just on a factual level, but also on an EQ level. Uh, so I constantly fall into that hole in myself. I don't know how to 
uh, you know, get out of it or get better at it because it just seems to be uh, ingrained. And when you're 71 years old, you know, it's not so easy to, to uh, no, change your change your habits uh, so quickly, but it's a really important part, Kevin, that you raised there, and and I think we need to just be super conscious of it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, well, Tom. the chips and the vaccine are going to help. I think so. That'll be good. Yeah. yeah, totally. I feel like the remote control portion is hasn't yet kicked in properly. Uh, go ahead, Neil. Uh, I'm not sure if Klaus has finished yet, but just responding, if I may, to Kevin and to Klaus. Thank you for feeling the challenge. If we don't challenge, we're fucked. Hmm. And this is the problem that the, the level of violence in the system already, Kevin's just been talking about, you know, the social rights, uh, you know, black rights, black lives matter movements and so on. Hmm. You know, they don't get to where they get through peaceful demonstration. Hmm. We're not going to change the paradigm through peaceful acceptance of every perspective we're going to have to somewhere say, which of these perspectives matters most? That's actually the name of one of your platforms. Um, and in how are we going to decide which perspective matters most, unless we are about honoring all life, not honoring one group or another group. And so the critical element here is we need to create a safe enough space, not a safe space, a safe enough space for these sorts of courageous conversations to occur Otherwise, nothing will change and we're on a deadline. And the deadline has probably already been passed. So the question then becomes, how do we approach the abyss, literally the abyss, with the equanimity, with the grace, with the dignity required as humans, fully developed humans if possible, and with actually the, the benefit of the whole in mind to keep doing no regret strategies, even though there may be no hope. And that is really hard. And if you don't challenge, nothing changes. So I don't back down from what I said, and I'm not taking a superior perspective. I'm saying those of us who've had the privileged opportunity to get to this point in our development, where we can actually see this shit coming down the line, if we don't take a stance, then we are not fulfilling our humanity. Thank you. It brings us back to we need to operate from a position of trust, assuming good intentions in one another. And once we have reached that stage, then we can uh, we can say things that are not like not perfect and accept you know, with humility that uh, hey, that didn't come across so well. Thank you all. Um, we're not going to make it. We spent a lot of time on other things, so we're not going to make it through everybody for check-in. But let's uh, let's go to Julian, Lorelai, and Pete. Well, my comments are on a, a very different line. And actually, a lot of it follows up on what Neil said a little while ago about building bridges of information between people, because that's my goal, is that I want everybody to be able to communicate. So after spending several straight weeks being spending all the day in Zoom meetings, I finally got some work done a few days ago. And I now have a really solid pathway from the brain to Neo4j. Uh, ran into some issues in dealing with data elements, which in the IT world would call blobs. And then the uh, Free Jerry's Brain Call Monday got a whole bunch of good suggestions on how to handle that. The point of getting into Neo4j, uh, first off, not that it's Neo4j specifically, but it's just that I'm used to working with it. But the eventual goal there is to build semantic knowledge networks so that we can trade knowledge and not just pieces of data. And as you know, that my interest is in doing that in 3D. But the point is to make knowledge something visceral, bring it home, going back to an old saying from Confucius, when people can look at stuff on the screen and they can hear talking heads talking at them, but when something is really driven home, then they take it to heart. And it needs to be driven home in a subjective way, right? Because everybody perceives things differently. And so my goal is to be using technology to accomplish all of these long-term, when everybody has taken knowledge to heart, then they're going to be communicating on a whole different level. So the brain was a good start with that. And now from that, I can start moving in two ways. One is building up these knowledge networks using the more sophisticated semantic analysis tools. The other is in building interactive systems of managing the brain. So for example, uh, if you take a, one of your brains and move it out into a graph database, then use my interactive management tool to manage your brain instead of using the brain software to manage your brain. So it becomes a, a different embodiment of the brain. And so this is the next thing to work on after spending the rest of the day in Zooms. 
It's a nice break from Zooms, that's for sure. Um, and I was also going to mention something on a totally different tack, because in the past I've mentioned I used to be the chief scientist at LEGO. Uh, LEGO started uh, earlier this year a podcast series on their different digital efforts, and the one uh, in uh, about four weeks ago was on the division I was in, so I'll put a link to that. And uh, it's it was actually a really nicely done uh, analysis of SPU Darwin, that's what our division was called. So it's uh, 70 minutes, but it's pretty well done. That sounds great. Thanks, just, Julian. Just checking, Julian, does, is, a, is a Lego podcast something you put on your foot if you step on it at night? No, actually, the American Medical Association has treated that officially. There's an operation known as a legoectomy, which involves surgical removal of the Lego brick. Oh, it's good to know. It's good to know. And I thought it would be called a Lego plaster. Uh, which is made, yeah. which is not, which is not an anagram of podcast, but still, um, cool. Let, let's go, Lorelai, Pete, Klaus. So it's, I'm Lorelai Shmayo. Um, I've been having some conversations with Pete, and I just came to the um, Chico Lab, Kiko Lab meeting um, a week and a half ago. Um, I'm, I was a scientist. I worked a little bit in medicine and agriculture, and I also worked in the intellectual property field. And I now work in the people field. I'm a coach, I'm an intuitive. I um, coordinate some communities and I have some um, unique work. I recognize people's personalities in their eyes. Um, just so I'm, I'm one of the people that's actually needing to learn to like reframe how I think about things and open more to how collaboration would really support me. Um, I think technology would support my work growing out in the world, um, as well as just all kinds of communities and collaboration. So I'm here sort of expanding myself and um, then opening and also seeing how I can be support of support to what you're all up to. Awesome. Thank you, Lorelai. And it's, um, you remind me that there's sort of different, one of the ways I see OGM is it has different layers. It has this geeky lower layer, which is like distributed linked contextualized warm data. Then it has this middle layer, which is very geeky, which is about visualization tools and data analysis and how do we argue and argumentation th theory and all that kind of stuff. And then there's this lovely top layer, which is about presence and vulnerability and facilitation and bridging the, the, the gap and othering and all of that. And we don't get there very often. We don't get there often enough. And we don't, we don't spend a lot of time there. And uh, Ken Homer sent me a note saying he couldn't make today's call, but Ken tries to bring us back there now and then because he has uh, really deep skills with like somatic facilitation and other sorts of things. Uh, but I think we need to pay an, an awful lot more attention to that. And I appreciate you uh, you sort of being here and bringing your skills to, to, to the group. So happy to try to figure out how, how I don't know, how to, how to sort of meld with your superpowers in some way. <laughs> I don't know exactly how to describe it. No, it's great. Thank you. Thank you for, for seeing me and, and, and uh, bringing out some more of what I value even more than I'm able to share it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pete, Klaus, John. Um, real quick, uh, I, I wanted, I don't know, I feel like apologizing for all the tech talk. Um, uh, we do social stuff too uh, here at OGM. And one of the really interesting things that's going on right now is uh, the Stewards Group is, is kind of finalizing uh, what's called the OGM Bootstrap Organization uh, and its relationship to Lionsburg um, and maybe some potential for grant, grant kinds of funding and things like that. Um, uh, if you're interested in hearing more, join the Stewards channel and ask questions. Um, uh, it's it's going really well. Um, we're we're super excited. We've done a lot of great work. Uh, Jordan is is uh, meeting us uh, well and things like that. Um, I wanted to mention um, and and actually along with that, I, I guess maybe I should say uh, Jordan and Lionsburg have contemplated not only kind of granting to OGM Bootstrap and the OGM Fund, but also to some other sovereigns like Massive and Trove. Um, uh, so we're working out the structures for additional sovereigns to uh, come in under uh, either OGM fund or maybe directly with Lionsburg, depending. So um, uh, there's there's cool stuff happening there. Um, I think uh, Jordan and I were talking a little bit. Massive Wiki expanded pretty quickly to Massive Human Intelligence, a Massive Human Intelligence Project. Um, so I'm I'm kind of thinking of that as an umbrella for a couple things that sit alongside Massive Wiki. 
Um, and I also wanted uh, to talk real quickly about three concepts that I, I have been talking about in the terms of wikis, but it turns out that they work also for sovereigns and federation. Um, so uh, the, the three concepts are chunking, um, breaking um, bigger, bigger things of information or people um, into chunks, smaller chunks, um, and then naming them and maybe renaming them merging them, reforming them, um, and then linking. So it, I, I had this epiphany this morning that the concepts I was talking, thinking about with in, in wikis actually really describes well um, the sovereigns in, in the Federation and the primordial soup that we're in too. Um, you want to find the right scale for doing chunks of, of, of work. Um, uh, so uh, massive wiki is a concentration of, of work that works well um, as a as a chunk, separate from a lot of the other stuff that's going on, and then uh, you want to chunk stuff and you want to name it uh, so that people can find it, and you want to start creating links between things. Uh, Massive wants to link up with Trove, for instance. So I'm I'm going to write that up more and and uh, talk about it more. But I'm super excited by kind of that conceptual thing going from wikis to also the federation that we find ourselves in. Love that. Um, just by the way, so the reason this call has to wrap at the half hour is that we have a standing call with Jordan around this process right after these calls, uh, which if somebody is interested, you know, if you're interested in, in, in the process, you're welcome to join. Um, so, so we're kind of at the point where there's a couple of MOUs about ready to be signed with Lionsburg, the entity that, that Jordan created in order to tow sovereign entities into the waters of, of uh, steward ownership which I can explain more uh, later, but uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting journey and we're like, it's been a lot of work, but it's been really fun. Uh, Klaus and John. Yeah, um, food business is, is um, uh, raising a long changing and morphing. I had this article uh, uh, hop into my mail inbox this morning, which is, um, sort of calling out uh, uh, corporate entities in the food business to uh, to fess up what they're really doing to change and adapt, um, which is of course also the focus of uh, the webinar that we have created. Um, and uh, so it's exciting to say we have already over uh, 600 uh, uh, signups for for this so far. Um, I'm just going to copy this in here for a moment again. But anyway, the, the, we had a meeting with the panel uh, yesterday, um, and I think we're going to have just a phenomenal conversation because what we're trying to accomplish here is to advance the, the conversation about regenerative agriculture and elevate it to a systems perspective. So there, there is a farmer, Farmer Trey uh, Hill, who has 13,000 acre, a 13,000 acre fourth generation farm. Um, and he will talk specifically to the hurdles that he has to really convert uh, his operation. Uh, and lots of that has to do with the supply chain unwilling to accommodate his needs. Um, and uh, which brings us to um, the engagement of the public to have to know uh, what, what is happening in the food sector. So the United Nations this year has focused on food uh, as the centerpiece. And they specifically are saying food systems uh, in, a, in a recognition that um, this is a very complex part of the economy that's tightly interwoven and over 70, almost 80% of it is controlled by chain operators who so far haven't stepped up to the plate at all. Uh, so uh, the, the business climate leaders is hosting this and um, there are some really, uh, uh, very motivated uh, uh, folks who, who are working to promote this. We're out in you know, multiple channels, social media and direct mail and so on. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm like super encouraged. So at the same time, Jordan sent me a note saying they have to draft a business plan for, <laughs> for, uh, for your uh, uh, food sector there. And, and I'm, tr I'm trying to, I'm, I'm like, totally focused on this webinar for next week right now. But you now the challenge really is how do you uh, how do you move this to the ground? How do, how do you get your feet on the ground and start moving something? I mean, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually 
uh, engage uh, with uh, folks who are already in an operational mode and and uh, and work with that. So. Um, Global Regeneration Collab may be a good partner uh, because they already have a communications platform that's so specialized. The gap that, that, that uh, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how do you frame this, but the gap in the system is the link for smaller independent multi-crop farmers to link to the market, to link to the wholesale market. You know, the, 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 all these food hubs and, and uh, uh, farmers markets and so on are a minuscule part of the entire business and, and this is not going to scale no matter what you do with it you know when 80 percent of the market is controlled by corporate entities then we have to engage corporate entities to participate so that's sort of you know there's the thought process underlying but it's an exciting project um and uh and uh we're starting to connect hopefully uh in uh, I'm, I'm, it's it's work in progress thank you Klaus. that was really that was really clear and helpful and good luck with the, the un summit that sounds sounds like it's gonna be great um john sorry for the shortness of time here but okay it's okay we can go quickly so uh to over generalize uh we as a group are looking we are sense makers but we're primarily looking at external knowledge uh, Oh, the, the, we're dealing with the cognitive biases, our own somewhat, but mostly others. <clears throat> and we're dealing with overwhelm, like there's way too much information and it's way too messy, way too. So all of the tools we've been talking about today and all the strategies and, and Pete's comments about chunking, I mean, they're all relevant to all that. They are also relevant to the question of what's the internal sense-making mechanisms that we're using? Where, where are the vulnerabilities of those things? And are there any tools for the internal sense making. Now we know about a couple. We know about cognitive biases, and we say, okay, let's study the biases as if you know that'll be enough to correct them. Now there is a, I'll call her a cognitive scientist. I don't know exactly what her PhD is in. Her name is Jill Nephew. Her new product is called Inquire, but it's spelled I N Q W I R E dot I O. It's I think it's beta. I mean I'm in it. <laughs> I just signed up. It feels kind of beta to me. Uh, the fascinating thing she's doing is she's very finely parsing what your brain does as a filtering mechanism as it tries to make sense out of things. So she's not stopping with belief. She's looking at roles. She's looking at when did you feel like an insider? What was that like? How might that have influenced what you saw? What would it be like if you could not be an insider? Let's do a scenario. There's no insiders, you know. Interesting. That's that's a stretch. I mean, I gotta. <laughs> on the one hand, I'm I'm happy she's asking such a difficult question. On the other hand, I got to give her feedback. She's got to help people more in this program because <laughs> for a lot of folks, that's too big a leap. Don't don't ask me to imagine a scenario in which there are no insiders. I mean, you can do it, but you got to give me more help. If you're going to ask me that and that's the kind of thing she asked me this morning i mean her program asked me that this morning i said wow interesting question people are going to need help to answer that kind of question she's got a lot more like that a lot of lens 35 different lenses that your brain uses to look at the world and then make sense out of it so and she's very concerned about privacy she's you write a lot of things in this program and they all stay on your computer and the only thing she collects are the decisions you make, you go put, put, you know, you do little sliders and you, did you answer this one? Did you not answer that one? Did you skip it? That's the data she collects and keeps <laughs> on her servers anonymously. So it's really interesting in many respects, most interesting in terms of sense making, also interesting as an example of how do you implement responsible privacy along with AI enhanced data, data collection about individuals, thought patterns and so forth. So stay tuned. I'll tell you more when I get further into the into the program. John, thank you. I, I hadn't heard of her and it sounds really interesting. And I love I love people who develop rich frameworks for understanding ourselves and shifting our behaviors and all of that. So it sounds very yeah. useful that way. She, she is brilliant. She's on the Clubhouse. You can find her. And if, if, if I put the click the bell, if you're a Clubhouse person, put the bell that says whenever she's talking, let me know, because if you find her in a room, what she's saying is definitely worth listening to. 
that's a good idea. All I have to do now is like go back in and listen to Clubhouse <laughs> ever again. It's like, man, uh, too much to do, too much to listen to uh, every day. So uh, why don't we wrap our call here? Um, Doug, thank you for, for coming in. Sorry you caught us just the very tail end of this. Um, yeah, I had a dental appointment. And these days, it's hard to find a dentist who has free time. <laughs> so Indeed, <clears throat> indeed. I was happy when my dentist was able to use like the, the micro blade, whatever they call it, abrasion thing, because it makes vapor. And they put a whole new thing in my cheek, which it sucks up. It, it basically, it's a little vacuum. So it's trying to create negative air pressure to suck up like the, the aerosol. It was all really interesting. I'm like, oh, yeah. Pan pandemic created some dental innovations. Um, so John, thank you all. Uh, Go from ahead. your background, are you a fellow beer? John? Uh, you're muted. <clears throat> I, I, I joined as a lifetime member of the Alumni Association, but I didn't actually go to Berkeley. I lived near it, and I saw it as a, such a great resource, and I wanted to use the library and everything. So I said, I'm, I'm going to buy a lifetime membership to the Alumni Association. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you all. See you online on the intertubes. Bye for now.